the uh, audio cassette days are over. Uh, <coughs> Sad, yeah. A moment of silence. <laughs> We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this month, and we thought of bringing out a vinyl edition, uh, but the costs were prohibitive. I, uh, I, you'll excuse me being in a, in a mercenary mood or mode for a moment. Uh, we just last night released uh, an app for Apple users, and I was just looking at the App Store. It just showed up last night. We've been working on it for months. And uh, I, wrote the, I got to write the description for the App Store, and I... Uh, 25 years of audio is what it says at the top. Um, more than 10 years before the term podcast was ever used, Marcel Audio launched an audio magazine, first distributed on cassette tapes, then CDs and MP3 downloads, then streaming from a website. Marcel Audio Journal can now be enjoyed through our free app. So you'll pardon the advertisement, but um, uh, that uh, is just available. And uh, since Bruce is an Android user, we'll work on an Android uh, version <laughs> of it soon. Um, I, it's appropriate that my talk begins uh, referencing a technology <laughs> um, in the, it, I've done a lot of interviews over the course of the years about the problems of various technologies and the problem of technology more generally, uh, sometimes to the point where people assume I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a Luddite of some sort. Uh, my kids are quick to point out that dad is not a Luddite, he's a recovering technophiliac. Um, uh, and I was, I actually got involved in, in broadcasting because of my interest in electronics. Um, I was telling Bruce at breakfast that I built a stereo from a kit when I was in high school and actually my first computer was built from a kit, um, Heath kit. <coughs> computer. I couldn't afford an IBM PC when they came out, so I built something that was comparable. And uh, so I've always been interested in, in, in gadgetry and, uh, and, and media, and then ended up working in um, uh, radio. <clears throat> and uh, later, as I started doing work in cultural criticism, realized the extent to which modern culture has been shaped not just by technologies, not just by devices and machines, but shaped by a mentality uh, according to which we tend to treat all things uh, in a mechanical or technological, in accordance with a kind of technological paradigm. Certainly more than ever in human history, our interaction with friends and family and neighbors and the world in general is enabled by various technologies. It's also shaped the, the, the kind of... Uh, the, the way we understand the world, not just the way we engage the world, is shaped by uh, the shape of those technologies. The gadgets themselves are linked to large social and commercial systems that are very interested in how and what we communicate. And typically among Christians, parents and clergy have focused attention on the content of media uh, and not as much on the forms of media and, and the way in which different forms of media uh, are meaningful in themselves, uh, how they, they, uh, they convey uh, certain postures. This is something I actually got. My undergraduate degree was actually in film theory and criticism. And so I spent a lot of time uh, as an undergraduate thinking about the difference between a communications medium that's primarily visual versus a communications medium uh, that's primary verbal. Um, whether it be print or radio. Um, and uh, because of that background, uh, er early in my career when I, I, I was doing teaching in churches, uh, was often trying to draw attention to the forms of media and not just uh, the content. Um, as I suggested, saying anything critical about technology invites the charge of being a Luddite. There's a book uh, by... Uh, Langdon Winner, who's I think one of the uh, very uh, a, a very perceptive uh, observer of technology and culture, uh, wrote a book called *The Whale and the Reactor*, which was subtitled *A Search for Limits in an Age of High Technology*. Uh, he noted in the book that his 
at the beginning that it's a book of technology criticism, implying he regards himself as a technology critic. But he insists that that role should be considered as analogous with that of a literary critic or an art critic or a music critic. Unfortunately, uh, people don't hear technology critic <laughs> analogous. He said, uh, if his book were literary criticism, everyone would immediately understand that the underlying purpose was positive. A critic of literature examines a work, analyzing its features, evaluating its qualities, seeking a deeper appreciation that might be useful to other readers of the same text. In a similar way, critics of music, theater, and the arts have a valuable, well-established role serving as a helpful bridge between artists and audience. Criticism of technology, however, is not yet afforded the same glad welcome. Writers who venture beyond the most pedestrian and dreary conceptions of tools and uses to investigate ways in which technical forms are implicated in the basic patterns and problems of our culture are often greeted with the charge that they are merely anti-technology or blaming technology. All who have recently stepped forward as critics in this realm have been tarred with the same idiot brush. <laughs> an expression of the desire to stop a much-needed dialogue rather than enlarge it. And then he concludes, if any readers want to see the present work as anti-technology, make the most of it. That's their topic, not mine. We can talk about technologies, talk about specific devices and their capacities, when we use the singular noun technology, sometimes rendered with a capital T, we really do have in mind a kind of mental and social and even spiritual ecosystem to which the devices have given rise and out of which they emerge. It's a recent book by Brian Brock, uh, a Christian ethicist, a book called Christian Ethics in a Technological Age, and he argues that technology is a way of perceiving all things in, in terms of objectifiable, in terms of objectifiability, rather, material efficiency, and manipulability. In other words, if I can paraphrase what he says, objectifiability, material efficiency, and manipulability. In other words, all things and even people come to be regarded as objects, not as subjects, uh, subjects with dignity and moral claims, and in the case of people, image bearers of God. Uh, and in the realm of technology, all things are thus potentially manipulable in the interests of efficiency. And so Brock goes on to say, quote, technology is a human mode of thought that in rejecting any role for divine action comes to approach all things and relationships as susceptible to human ordering and management. Um, there are, there's quite a bit of literature, I guess, um, Heidegger is probably the philosopher who begins to raise questions about technology as a mentality uh, that characterizes modernity. And my, one of my favorite uh, writers in, along this line was the Canadian philosopher George Parkin Grant. Uh, I put his middle name in there to distinguish him from the younger apologist from Tennessee, George Grant. I always think of them as George Grant the Elder and George Grant the Lesser. Uh, I actually know the one from Tennessee. I didn't know the one from Canada. Um, Brock is, in a sense, continuing that tradition uh, and following his line of argument, uh, I think it's appropriate to say that one of the effects of technology as a mentality is to eclipse our understanding of ourselves as creatures and all of the implications that our creatureliness implies. Uh, rather, I think we are tacitly encouraged to intuit ourselves as godlike in our role as makers of meaning and makers of significance. In accordance with the mentality, uh, the technological mentality or the technological paradigm, creation is not perceived as an ordered and good gift from a loving and personal creator. Rather, creation is regarded as just so much raw material. In fact, that phrase shows up a lot in some of the more thoughtful criticisms of technology. The idea of creation is just raw material with which we demonstrate our creativity and power and to which we assign meaning. Craig Gay, a sociologist who uh, has taught for years at Regent College, Craig Gay has argued, quote, for modern technological humanity, the important thing is not to discern how we might fit into a fixed order of nature, 
but instead how natural processes might be made to serve human interests. And here he's echoing a point that C.S. Lewis makes in The Abolition of Man, where he writes, and I'll do this from memory, for the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. But for, for, uh, for, for magic and modern science, or I can't, that's not the term he used. He's basically talking about technology. The problem is how to reorder nature to fit uh, human desires. So we either uh, try to, uh, to figure out how to order the, our souls to fit reality, or we try to figure out how do we reorder reality to fit our desires. And Craig Gay is saying the same thing. Uh, when we cast ourselves in that sovereign role, Craig Gay points out, quote, we lose the possibility of encountering something outside of ourselves which might discipline and thus give order to our human making and willing. And he goes on to conclude, quote, in the absence of such discipline, modern machine technology appears destined to be destructive of nature, of living human cultures, and indeed of living human beings. Uh, it just occurred to me as I was reading that, uh, someone told me I have the gift of bibliography, so you have to excuse me if I, <laughs> if I throw in what seem to be random footnotes often. But um, uh, Michael Hanby uh, has an essay uh, that was in First Things, and I'm blanking on the title of it, so I'm not a very good bibliographer here, but Michael, uh, who's a philosopher uh, at uh, Catholic University, has said that the sexual revolution is actually a continuation of the technological revolution. The sexual revolution is a technological revolution of modernity applied to our bodies. In other words, um, the sexual revolution is basically uh, saying we can arrange, it, it's, it, it amounts to regarding the body as a machine that can be uh, arranged, manipulated, rearranged uh, in accordance with whatever desires uh, uh, we, we have. The subject of technology and, uh, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned Craig Gay, uh, I, here's a bibliography. Uh, the book that I'm citing is The Way of the Modern World, or why it's tempting to live as if God doesn't exist. It's, uh, a very good summary. I used it for many years as a standard reading for our summer intern uh, program. And uh, he's uh, a, a trained in sociology, actually trained uh, by uh, Peter Berger, studied with Peter Berger, as did James Davison Hunter. Uh, the subject of technology and our assumptions about human nature is so intertwined with theological practices and cultural, or theological ideas and cultural practices uh, and institutions, it's hard to know where to begin and end. One of the points I want to make today quickly uh, is that living in a technological society affects more than our ideas. Uh, it shapes our sensibilities and our expectations about what it might mean to understand and adequately address uh, a cultural condition. Uh, when I was working on this talk, as when I work on other talks, uh, one always faces the desire to come up with a very neat outline that works like a flowchart, which analyzes the nature of the problem and then proposes a set of responses, uh, which is, in a sense, a, an approach that we get from, from engineering. Uh, I, I, and I, I think that we, we all tend to think that when we're addressing an issue, it's better to address it like an engineer than, than like a poet. But what if some problems are better addressed and when we think like poets uh, rather than as uh, engineers? I think um, the scriptures are filled with texts which regard, uh, and I think particularly in wisdom literature, in which reality is best approached uh, through poetry uh, rather than a kind of flowchart. Um, a, a book that I've benefited from uh, that doesn't talk much explicitly about technology and human identity, but, um, but does talk about the necessity of cultivating a deliberate and watchful attitude toward the cultural moment in which we live, uh, is Eugene Peterson's uh, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, uh, a book I've returned to numerous times. He writes at the beginning of that book that it is the task of the Christian community to give witness and guidance in the living of life in a culture that is relentless in reducing, constricting, and enervating life. The first time I read that, I'd forgotten what the word enervate meant, and I had to look it up in case you don't 
remember either it means to drain of energy and to weaken. Uh, the culture we live in is relentless in reducing, constricting, and enervating life, and the task of the Christian community is to give witness how to live well in that kind of culture. Um, a lot of technologies promise to, to make our lives more interesting and more compelling and more lively, but actually end up um, reducing and constricting uh, our lives. Peterson's point here is that uh, for all of its sound and fury, our culture has a thin and anemic account of what would constitute a life well lived, and that churches should be places in which the fullness of life is best experienced. Uh, the promises made by the vendors of various technologies and on a larger scale, the implicit promises made by the uh, technologically driven project of modernity flow out of an inadequate picture of human nature and the human vocation. So it's the task of churches to offer a better account, not just in our teaching, but in the shared way of life of people. A number of years ago, I was at a conference on the church and technology, and there were theologians and pastors and philosophers and technology professionals and a few journalists. And we spent a day and a half talking about how the use of various technologies affected for good and ill the life of congregations. And one of the concerns was the unintended consequences of new patterns of communication. At one point in the conversation, after six or seven hours of discussion, a pastor made some extended and somewhat heated remarks critical of the intricate analysis that was being offered by some of those who were worried that the church would harm its ministry by uncritical use of certain technologies. And he said that as a pastor, computers were simply tools that increased his efficiency. They were qualitatively no different from a typewriter. This is back before the internet, and uh, th this was back when, uh, well, there was email, and, but we didn't have smartphones when as this conference took place. So we're looking principally at computers, not, not, uh, not handheld devices. Now, the room kind of went silent at this point after he said this, and, uh, but quickly uh, one of the other respondents uh, gave an even more heated response to his protest that the computer is no different than a typewriter. There's a woman there, uh, a scholar named Anne Forst, uh, who was... Um, then working at MIT's Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Uh, she uh, had, uh, I don't know, numerous doctorates in various disciplines and also had some theological training. And after the pastor finished his exasperated and skeptical rejection of a lot of what had been said in this conference, Dr. Forst stood up and she exclaimed really loudly with great passion and, and, and obvious frustration. And what added to it is she had a strong German accent, so that lent a, a quality to it also. She, she says, a computer is not just a tool. It is a metaphor. No one ever compared a human being to a typewriter. And the room went even more silent at this point. No one compared a human being to a typewriter. That probably is true. Although. And uh, this, uh, I, I remember that moment because uh, I think that the, uh, the extent to which technologies become metaphors that we then use to, they become images that we recast our own experience in light of. Um, uh, we, are, we recreate ourselves after the image of our devices uh, very frequently. And uh, so... The computer has, in fact, become uh, a model for many people in understanding how the brain works or how reason functions or how education should happen. And so computers have a great deal of influence in shaping educational institutions, not just as tools, not just, but as metaphors guiding, uh, guiding the direction of, uh, about, the, uh, about the nature of learning. So, and and uh, computers have reinforced certain understandings of what reason is and how we reason. Uh, uh, and obscured or eclipsed uh, 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 other, other understandings of the nature of reason and hence of the nature of truth. Computers have become metaphors for human nature as such. Uh, information technologies can encourage the sense that human beings are information processors whose lives are invariably improved when they process more and more information faster and more capacious. 
and, and, and when we have more capacious databases. Uh, the metaphoric power of computers is so strong that they've induced some people to fantasize about eliminating their embodied existence, achieving a kind of immortality by transferring their consciousness to a computer. Of course, this happened in Star Trek, The Next Generation. Uh, but, uh, and I actually had a young man working for me who had worked uh, doing uh, high-end computer work at, for Boeing for the space shuttle program years ago. And he said he had a lot of his fellow engineers who did fantasize about being able to upload their consciousness to a computer. I seriously thought. And there are people like Ray Kurzweil and others, uh, the, 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 the so-called transhumanists, who, who believe very strongly that, uh, that we'll someday escape the, the mortality and the, all of the limitations of embodied existence as we pair ourselves with uh, with uh, mechan mechanisms of various kinds. Now, um, the, so the computer as metaphor has a bigger effect on our culture, I think, than actual computers do. By affecting our understanding of the nature of rationality, of communication, of memory, of identity, of relationships, uh, and many other important aspects of human personhood. Tools are extensions of ourselves, and it is tempting to re-envision ourselves as wielders of tools. What is the line to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Uh, technologies enable us to accomplish old things more efficiently, to accomplish entirely new things, and to organize life in different ways. So, but far from their practical uses, technologies exert an influence on our imaginations based on the shape of experiences we have under the influence of technologies. Uh, think about multitasking, for instance, people who cherish the possibility of multitasking. That's reimagining work and thought in the way computers do work and thought, uh, not necessarily in the way human beings do it well. Uh, not long after clocks were invented, the image of the clockwork was used to describe other complex phenomena, including the organization of cosmos. The clocks didn't cause a newly mechanistic view of the universe, but they did provide the imaginative room for that view to take hold. The more sophisticated our tools become, that is, the closer to th that the tasks they perform are to uniquely human activities, like reasoning or verbal communication, the more tempting it is to regard them not merely as extensions, but as reflections of ourselves revealing heretofore concealed or underappreciated aspects of our own being. But those metaphoric leaps may be unwarranted. They may be misleading and they may really be dehumanizing. I think we need to be more watchful about, how, uh, about technology, uh, technology's influence, um, to be attentive to the way in which the pull of technologies on our imagination can mislead us in our intuiting about the meaning of human nature and human well-being. Uh, we're often tempted to infer that patterns of human activity that are most in keeping with the efficient operation of our machines, patterns of life that actually keep our devices happy, will also make us happiest. I was once warned, by the way, I should say, that we shouldn't anthropomorphize computers. They hate that. Uh, <laughs> That I'm dumb. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, very useful devices can become harmful devices when we make the mistake of assuming that we should reorder our practices to suit their strengths, rather than select devices and patterns of their use that advance purposes that are most fitting for the kinds of creatures we actually are. I've seen this in my own life as I've adjusted my workflow to fit the devices, rather than find the devices that that are most fitting and most useful for the workflow that serves the ends of my work. And I'm sure all of us find ourselves uh, in, in, in that. Uh, so we're a little bit like Charlie Chaplin in that iconic scene from modern times when he's depicted as a worker over this huge gear uh, and he's kind of entrapped in the machine. We, we all kind of run the risk of, of that kind of entrapment. Um, Americans are proverbially pragmatic people, and that may account for the way in which technologies are 
typically given the benefit of the doubt and why technology critics are seen as Luddites and, and, and anti-progress or anti-technology. I think, though, a truly practical people would be eager, eager to ascertain which technologies are really best suited to accomplish the practical ends to which they might be applied. I think it may be closer to the truth to say, if it sounds paradoxical, that we have idealized practicality. Uh, we're so enamored of ingenuity and invention and the can-do energy of engineering that we find it all too easy to lose sight or minimize the importance of ends that may in fact be threatened by new technical capacities. I think Ilyul says somewhere in the technological society that one of the characteristics of a technological society is uh, a, a fascination with means and a forgetfulness toward ends. Uh, that we, we, um, we're looking for how to accomplish things and we spend more time on how to accomplish things than we do reflecting on what is it that we really should accomplish. When I read that, I suddenly realized why so many committee meetings had been frustrating for me <laughs> over the course of years uh, because the committees were often talking about what we should do and how we should do it, but not why and not what ends we're really trying to achieve. Um, uh, uh, also, uh, Oliver O'Donovan, similarly in his book uh, on the ethics of in vitro fertilization called Begotten or Made, uh, talks about what characterizes a technological society is the loss of any notion that there are some things that are natural and not, not artificial. That there are some things that are, that are in keeping with our nature and with the nature of nature, with the, the nature of reality and some things which are, uh, uh, and uh, he, he says that every, everything is regarded as an artifact. Everything is regarded as the process, as the product of a human series of choices. So um, in a non-technological society, uh, uh, well, no, I won't give that example. That takes us down another. <laughs> um, so I think in, in, we've idealized uh, practicality. A, a wondrous new device might serve no previously acknowledged need or might actually impede the pursuit of some good to which we'd previously been committed, but we nonetheless are likely to vote in favor of the new gadget. And I say this as not as... Uh, I say this as, a, as an act of self-criticism and repentance because I know many times when I've been an early adopter of some gadgetry that I didn't really need, but I thought, well, how, can, how might I rearrange my life so that I will need this? <laughs> because it's a, it's a pretty thing. I like it. It's a shiny thing. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, one way in which technologies are given benefit of the doubt is the common assumption that technologies are neutral. They're simply tools that can be used virtuously or viciously depending on the intent of the one who uses them. But as Langdon Winner observes in one of his books, the crucial weakness of the conventional idea is that it disregards the many ways in which technologies end up providing the structure for human activity. In other words, he says, technologies are not merely aids to human activity, but also powerful forces acting to reshape that activity and its meaning. Everyday life is, the shape of everyday life is transformed by technologies so that individual habits, perceptions, concepts of self, ideas of space and time, social relationships, and moral and political boundaries have all been powerfully restructured in the course of modern technological development. And I think here, as I read that, this was written long before social media, so-called social media, and the technologies that enable social media were developed. But think about how relationships and the shape of relationships has been changed radically because of the technologies which enable, uh, which, which have been exploited by uh, by social media. And social media being, uh, after all, let's face it, a, 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 essentially a commercial project, a large commercial project. Uh, we ga we uh, basically are the, um, we are the commodities of Facebook. We're not just the users of Facebook. Um, technologies often convey new forms of power uh, and it's difficult to resist the offering of new capacities to do things, even if there are things we don't need to do or even want to do. New capacities for exercising control over nature and history are generally regarded positively by people who are afraid of angering the god of progress, and that is a cult that many Americans uh, belong to. <clears throat> 
As Christian people, our duty to love our neighbors requires that we seek the best for them, and that requires sustaining a vision for human flourishing that's rooted in an understanding of human nature that has certain fixed aspects and certain boundaries. Mere ingenuity is not a reliable asset, either for individuals or societies. All the way back to the garden, promises of progress through the acquisition of new capacities demand careful evaluation. I think that Christians are almost the only people left in the West who have a good reason to have a high view of the givenness and sacredness of human nature. So we ought to be the most discerning in evaluating whether or not specific cultural forces generally and specific technological developments in particular advance or deter human flourishing. So we need to encourage the sort of technical or technological criticism that Langdon Winner is advocating and that many, uh, many other, I think of Sherry Turkle, uh, uh, Bruce and I were talking at breakfast about Sherry Turkle and Jaron Lanier, two people who are very immersed in the world of technology, Sherry Turkle having taught at MIT for many years, Jaron Lanier, the guy who invented virtual reality, uh, both of whom have become very critical of, of, uh, of various technologies and their social effects, uh, not just the uses to which they're put, but, but the inherent uh, prejudices they seem to, to have within them. Uh, and uh, Lanier, uh, who... Uh, he has a, I, th I think it's his book, You Are Not a Gadget, that, uh, where he's, what, I think it's subtitled A Manifesto, <laughs> uh, in which he uh, criticizes particularly the way in which social media had taken shape. Um, but uh, he uh, complains in the, in the paperback edition of that book how much he has been dismissed as a, as a Luddite. Here's the guy who invented virtual reality. <laughs> he has uh, honorary doctorates from every major uh, technical institute in the country. Uh, he was scholar in residence at Microsoft for a number of years. Uh, he's like the, he's like a, uh, he's a member of the Digerati. He's not, uh, he's not a Luddite. Um, but, uh, but as soon as you begin to criticize, um, th then you, you get dismissed. The church ought to be, uh, not anti-technology, but, uh, but um, we ought to be uh, leaders in what I, I remember w somewhat uh, wistfully back in the 70s when people used the term appropriate technology. I haven't heard that term in a while. Uh, there are, are apparently now no inappropriate technologies. Um, to criticize technology doesn't make you anti-technology any more than a discerning, evaluative approach to film or literature means that you're anti-movies or anti-books. I want to say one word uh, in closing then about meta uh, this idea of m machines and metaphors. I've come to really appreciate the role that metaphor has in, 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 uh, in providing, uh, providing or enabling meaning for us. Um, I, I, there was an essay, in, I think it was in the journal the Evangelical Theology Society years ago. It was comparing C.S. Lewis and Gordon Clark, the Christian philosopher, on their v different views of metaphor. And Gor Gordon Clark took a position which, which you find very starkly in John Locke's work, in which Locke is very critical of the, the use of figurative speech. He thinks it's, it's obscuring and, uh, and unclarifying. Uh, uh, and uh, Gordon Clark held this highly rationalistic, austere view, whereas Lewis believed that um, metaphors uh, were essential to the perception of meaning. Uh, Lewis once observed, if our thinking is ever true, uh, the metaphors by which we think must be good metaphors. Uh, he uh, argued in one of his essays that the likenesses that are traditionally asserted between goodness and light or between evil and darkness or between breath and soul are not arbitrary or fanciful, but they're representative of some likeness that's actually embedded in the order of creation. So they're good metaphors. Or they're good metaphors and they're bad metaphors. Uh, I like to go even further and say that when Jesus says, consider the lilies of the field, or when the psalmist uh, in Psalm 1 encourages us to ponder the likenesses between a righteous man and a tree planted by a stream. 
a tree that we're told yields its fruit in due season, whose leaf does not wither, that when these likenesses are, commanded, are commended to us, that they're reflecting a poetic structure to creation itself. That when God created l- trees and lilies with their metaphoric capacity, that, cr- uh, uh, that, that God did create trees and lilies with that metaphoric capacity in mind. That creation is meaningful precisely because it's shot through with metaphoric possibility. I was lecturing on this topic once, focusing on poetry, and someone then sent, uh, I, I, I suggested that I'd like to have a bumper sticker that says, poetry happens. <laughs> and, uh, and someone sent me, someone got one made up, and I had it on my truck for a while. Poetry happens. Poetry happens because we live in a world shot through with metaphor. But not everything can be likened to just anything. More specifically, I believe organic metaphors are generally more apt in describing aspects of human experience than mechanical metaphors, in part because mechanical metaphors tend to be reductionistic. In, in mechanisms, uh, the parts are separable from one another and, and, and uh, often replaceable uh, and are extrinsic to one another, whereas in organisms, the members of an organism are intrinsic to one another. Organic metaphors retain the possibility of the mystery sustained by living things. There's a difference between God-made things and man-made things, between things begotten and things made. Wendell Berry touches on this reductionistic problem in his book, Life is a Miracle. He writes at the beginning, the most radical influence of reductive science has been the virtually universal adoption of the idea that the world, its creatures, and all the parts of its creatures are machines. That is, there's no difference between creature and artifice, birth and manufacture, thought and computation. Our language, wherever it is used, is now almost invariably conditioned by the assumption that fleshly bodies are machines full of mechanisms, fully compatible with the mechanisms of medicine, industry, and commerce, and that minds are are computers fully compatible with electronic technology. And Barry concludes by observing, quote, this may have begun as a metaphor, but in the language as it's used and as it affects industrial practice, it has evolved from metaphor through equation to identification. And this institutionalizes the human wish or the sin of wishing that life might be or might be made to be predictable. In other words, one of the reasons we like using mechanistic metaphors to describe human living is because we want to imagine the world to be something like a machine. Uh, and if it's like a machine, then we have the capacity to re-engineer and control it. So our pre- preference for mechanistic metaphors isn't that they're more apt, but it's f- it, that they actually, and I love the way he puts it, that this institutionalizes the human wish or the sin of wishing that life might be made to be predictable. Reimagining human life in mechanical terms, is a way of enabling and legitimizing that project of control. Now, unless you think, uh, lest you think that Barry overstates his tendency, I want to read some passages from a book called Flesh and Machines, How Robots Will Change Us, by a guru, robotics guru Rodney Brooks, who was director, when the book was published in 2002, director of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. He was more recently the Panasonic Professor of Robotics at MIT. And he says in the book, we are nothing more than a highly ordered collection of biomolecules. This body, this mass of biomolecules, is a machine that acts according to a set of specific rules. And later he writes in a spurt of anti-sentimentality, we are machines, as are our spouses, our children, and our dogs. Now why he leaves out cats, I'm not sure. (laughs) And later he insists... (laughs) I'm not sure if it's ironic or not. We, all of us, over-anthropomorphize humans <laughs> who are, after all, mere machines. So we run, run the danger of anthropomorph, over-anthropomorphizing humans. This brutally brave assertion brings to mind an, observe, an observation that's also in Wendell Berry's book. The language that we use to speak of the world and its creatures has gained a certain analytic power along with a lot of expertish pomp, but has lost much of its power to designate what is, being anal- what is being analyzed or to convey any respect or care or affection or devotion toward it. And later, 
Barry makes it clear he's not entirely opposed to the machine metaphor as a way of understanding certain aspects of biology. The metaphor had a certain usefulness as a metaphor, but the legitimacy of a metaphor depends upon our understanding of its limits. When a metaphor is construed as an equation, it is out of control. When it is construed as an identity, it is preposterous. There is, and this may be a little bit like a footnote, there's something ironic about Rodney Brooks's effort to get to the bottom of biomolecules and the allegedly simple, simply mechanical nature of their functioning, because beneath biology, there is physics. And since the middle of the last century, the last thing physicists have been eager to do is to explain what happens at the most fundamental level of physical processes in terms of simple machines. Steve Talbot, in his book Devices of the Soul, notes that for 60 years <coughs> or more, quote, the entire movement of physics has been away from concrete machine models, and indeed away from models altogether. Talbot argues if you want to be reductionistic, that is, if you want to reduce higher things to the lowest level, quote, then you need to start with whatever is at the bottom, and your primary explanatory apparatus, in other words, is quantum weirdness. And the one place in science where you absolutely cannot find a machine is amidst, is amidst the scarcely utterable perplexities of the quantum realm. That's kind of a footnote. It turns out there are limits to the usefulness of the mechanical metaphors from both ends. At the macro level, at the level of life as a living organism, it doesn't explain human consciousness. It doesn't explain anything else that we really care about as human beings. At the micro level, there are mysteries within mysteries that, by contrast, make the problem of explaining consciousness look simple. I want to close with uh, a text from Isaiah, Isaiah 44, uh, picking up on the idea of recasting ourselves after the image of our devices. Uh, this is a, a passage that describes the folly of idolatry in which the prophet uses language that I think also depicts an idol as a technical achievement. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man, with the beauty of a man, to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak, and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. And he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. <laughs> over, the other, over the half he eats meat, he roasts it, and is satisfied. And he warms himself and says, Aha, I'm warm, I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me for you are my god. It's a wonderful bit of sarcasm uh, in the scriptures. And again, Psalm 135 similarly picks up on this idea. Uh, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. That is, they have attributes that appear to be personal, uh, as our devices appear to be personal, but the appearances are deceiving. And then comes this warning to idol makers, and I suggest to those of us who are technophiliacs, those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. We become like what we worship. We imagine ourselves in the likeness of things that we believe will deliver us from whatever plate we're in, even if they're things that we ourselves have fashioned. <laughs>